racing, designing, fixing, and collecting automobiles has long been thought of as things men do. However, women have been a part of it since the beginning. From early cross-country road trips and racing to inventing and designing many of the features on today's cars, women have been inspired by the freedom of the road. Women on Wheels, coming up next on Inspire. Inspire is sponsored by Kansas Furniture Mart, using furniture to inspire conversation. And by the Blanche Bryden Foundation. And welcome to Inspire. I'm here with my co-host Betty Lou Pardue and Leslie Flavrange. America has a passion for automobiles and the culture that surrounds them. We all have a few cars and trucks embedded in our memories. Today we put the pedal to the metal and get revved up for Women on Wheels. We also learn how two passions combined for an ornamental experience. Here to talk about Women on Wheels are Deanna Flanagan and Ann Palmer, and we're so glad you're here. <laughs> and I love this because, Ann, you have loved cars for a long time. What inspired you? You know, first of all, I'm delighted to be here because there's hardly anything I like to talk about better than cars. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's hard to say what inspired me, but I know it might have been in utero, I'm not sure, because wow. my earliest memory, I was probably about six, and we were somewhere, and I said, Grandma, what's that car? Because it looked different, you know, to me. And she said, oh, Anne, they all look alike to me today. And I, kind of, oh, I didn't wow. say anything, but I went, oh, 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 oh. my grandmother thinks cars look alike. Uh -huh. I didn't want to tell her anything, but yeah. so I know I was interested that far that back. That young. Um, as I got older, I began to really catalog cars, and, mm -hmm. and um, I know I have to tell you up front, I don't know even how an engine works, okay. and I don't have to. Okay. It's all about no, the style. No, you don't have to. Now, yeah. the noise is important. Okay. The noise of that engine, and I am addicted to the sound of a good engine. Mm -hmm. And if I ever owned an electric car, which I'm not sure I ever will, I would put a Porsche engine recorder in it. Because <laughs> there is no sound, There's no sound to the electric ones. No sound. No. It and throws me off. It's such a loss. Yes, it yeah. is. It is. For car totally. people. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so from loving cars to actually working in the automobile industry, um, Deanna, tell us a little bit about the SCCA. So the SCCA, or the Sports Car Club of America, is um, an amateur um, organization um, made up of 50,000 members across the country and a few overseas as well. Um, and we also are a sanctioning body for amateur race events as well as a few professional events. We are a non-for-profit, not-for-profit member organization. So. Um, basically, all of the activities that um, happen within the SCCA are put on by our members, who are all volunteers. We have 115 different regions across the country wow. who are, so those are kind of like franchises. They're subsidiaries of the organization, so um, they are the ones that host our competition motorsports events. Um, and like I said, the members really do the work. We have a small national office located mm -hmm. uh, here in Topeka, um, about 35 employees, but um, it's really our members who are boots on the ground yeah. um, delivering this That's amazing experience. though. I mean, a national office right here and mm -hmm. you're born and bred Topeka. What got you interested in automobiles? So my path to the SCCA was a bit unconventional. The um, national organization had been located in Denver for oh. several years. Okay. And in 2002, they relocated here to Topeka. And um, most people in the SCCA find their way as a participant or their families had been involved in the club for years and years. 
and my job career path brought me to the SECA. So uh, they were hiring for a number of positions and my aunt was hired as the receptionist. She gave them my name and 20 years later, wow. here I sit, um, uh, involved in overseeing our road racing program in the country. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it's well, been quite a journey. Speaking of racing, mm -hmm. you said that you got to be in one of the race cars. Talk about that and how fast you went. <laughs> okay, so yes, I've had um, a number of opportunities to get behind the wheel. Um, I've done a couple of professional driving schools. Mm. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's just an undescribable, mm -hmm. thrilling experience um, being you know, strapped into a car. And the back straight of Road Atlanta uh, is pretty high speed. Mm -hmm. And so my top speed for that school was about 130. Wow. Yes. Oh. That was good. Yeah. Yeah. Good yeah. with that. Uh, <laughs> didn't, didn't feel like buying a Mustang that day. So I thought that was uh, So tell me then, good. you know, so I, I am, famous among my friends and family for driving way too fast. <laughs> One of the things that I love about Kansas versus New York is that I can go 85, 95, soon down I-70 at any given time. You should time. not tell anybody <laughs> that. I just I shared that. She didn't say that. Just no, say that. No. <laughs> However, you know, that's a straightaway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I'm doing these roundabouts in Topeka, I notice that, you know, you have to kind of move with the car in order for you to, you know, turn correctly. Have you, you know, do you guys teach people how to drive as well as have them in the cars? We have schools, we have various different programs, you know, down to autocrossing, which happens in parking lots and um, tarmacs of airports. And then we also have track events that do happen on purpose-built racetracks. Um, and at all levels, there are schools and coaching that teach people how to drive their cars, you know, performance driving and become one with it. And that being slow in the car is actually how you go fast. So you wanna, you know, make slow movements, small movements, as few movements um, as you can to keep best control over the car. So, so we're gonna learn more about driving fast, mm -hmm. but if somebody doesn't want to drive fast and they want to appreciate the beauty of the car walking around, <laughs> that's let's, a good segue, let's, let's, let's get in there to like, you actually have a photographic collection of hood ornaments. Please explain. I also like to drive fast. Okay. <laughs> but um, again, I've had a lifelong obsession with cars. But probably about 15 years ago, I had been to a couple of car museums a long time ago, and I love them, but this was in Reno, and it was the Hera Museum, Hera's, which yeah. is a famous museum. Sure. And I had my camera, I'm a photographer, and um, I went in and I was overwhelmed because it was filled with cars, jammed with cars. You know, they, they're not a museum that cares about placement and all of that. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a lens wide enough and I couldn't back up enough to take a picture of a car. So I thought, okay, this is your opportunity. You're never gonna get it again. So I thought, okay, wheels, um, you know, steering wheel, um, bumper. I would just, and then I thought, oh my gosh, Ann, hood ornaments. <laughs> so that's when I started. There are a few hood ornaments before 1920 but not a lot. A lot of the early cars simply had oil gauges, mm -hmm. you know, oh, that yeah. might have been attractive, but they weren't hood ornaments. Yeah. So the 20s and the 30s, a little bit into the 40s, but the 20s and 30s were the heyday of hood ornaments. Mm -hmm. And they are works of art. Wow. And this was Art Deco, and particularly in the 30s, very much Art Deco ornaments. And interesting, I'll, I'll give you all a little test. Okay. Of all the cars in all the countries that I have ever seen, there is only one car that from the beginning in the teens to now have the same hood ornament or at least badge because we don't have hood anymore. Okay. Anybody know what that is? Mercedes. It's yeah. you got it. Yeah. You got it. That's right, unchanged. Uh, many of the others had a variety, sometimes at the same time. And I learned how to photograph them. And I give programs on it. And about three years ago, someone approached me 
they were had did open a new car museum in Manhattan. I'd like to give publicity to oh, it. Oh sure, yeah. sure. If yeah. you like cars, yeah, there's something for everybody. And they were looking for an expert in the 20s and 30s. They had the muscle car, they had the exotic experts, the old old cars, and so they chose me, and I was delighted. If anybody here or in the audience, it is a first-class museum. Well, I can't wait to get there. And you know, this has been a fascinating conversation. <laughs> Who knew how much fun we could have talking about cars? But we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll keep the conversation rolling. So don't go anywhere. going to be talking about moles in your lawn and in your garden. A lot of us have problems with moles and I've heard some pretty funny solutions including juicy fruit gum or flooding the moles to get rid of them in your yard. Unfortunately those things are not effective. There are some chemical controls that are effective but many of them are restricted to homeowners and can only be used by licensed pest control companies. So today I'm going to talk to you about what a homeowner can do if you have moles in your landscape and you'd like to get rid of them the most effective homeowner control for moles is gonna be traps. And there are a few varieties of traps. I have two here in front of me that are extremely effective. Some that use tines that actually go down into the ground to pierce the mole and killing it. And others that have jaws, sort of a clincher, similar to what you would think a mouse trap would operate as. Both of these take care of the issue under the ground so that it's nothing that you have to see or deal with. But setting them can be extremely difficult. The first step if you're gonna set a mole trap is gonna be finding a run that the moles are using regularly. So every day when moles go out to feed, they're burrowing through your yard and they have sort of a zigzag pattern. Those are feeding tunnels and they're looking for food but they're typically not gonna use those same tunnels again. What you wanna look for is their primary run. Usually the primary run is gonna be a straight line. Sometimes it's up against the base of your home, your garage, or a fence. So look for something that looks much straighter than their burrowing runs. Then you wanna go out and with your foot or with your hand, collapse part of that run, and then come back the next day and see if the mole rebuilt it. If they rebuilt it, that's how you know that that run is being regularly used, and that's gonna be a good place to set your trap. The next thing you wanna think of when you're setting your trap is not to collapse too much of the run. You have to collapse part of it so that the mole will stop and that's what sets off the trap. But if you collapse a large portion of the run, the mole is gonna fix it, the vibrations will come through the, to the trap, it will collapse, and the mole will be nowhere near where it needs to be to be killed by the trap. So you wanna take actually just the side of your hand, the side of your palm, and that's the only amount that you wanna hit on the run to collapse. It's only about an inch or two wide. If you use your shoe or a shovel or anything like that, it's gonna be much too wide. So use the side of your hand to collapse part of the run, set your trap up in that area, and when the mole comes through, you're much more likely to be successful killing the mole in that small area that you've collapsed. Now that being said, it still may take several attempts, and more than likely, you're gonna have several moles in your yard. So be persistent, be patient, and soon you will have good control using traps on moles in your yard. Finally, I just wanna say that if you see moles in your yard and you're not sure whether or not you wanna control them, consider that moles are a natural Kansas animal. They do do a lot of beneficial feeding on grubs and things that we don't necessarily want. So if you have a small amount of mole activity in your yard and it's not bothering you, feel free to leave them as they are as I'm sure they would appreciate. We're back with Deanna Flanagan and Ann Palmer. Ladies, in the last segment, we talked about hood ornaments, going fast, <laughs> the love of cars. Uh, tell me, Deanna, with the SCCA, uh, right, you said that, you know, you were on a career path. Is there a career path in uh, car racing for women? Oh, 100%. There are so many aspects to motorsports. It's not just driving, right? Um, it takes teams of people to actually get a car on track and get the driver in it. So from race engineers to mechanics to team managers mm -hmm. to pit crews, pit now. crews. Yes, yes. yes. Um, yeah. absolutely. Um, even on the 
PR and social media side, just promoting the sport. And then, of course, putting on the events, you know, mm -hmm. being a race official and a quarter worker, which is the best seat in the house besides <laughs> being in the car. You are steps away from the track. Your job is to communicate with the drivers and the car through flags. And, um, you know, so that's a really important job. So, yes, I mean, the possibilities are numerous. And, yeah, it, you know, obviously it's a pretty male-dominated mm -hmm. um, industry and sport, uh, but we see every year more and more women getting involved in nice. it. Nice. How are you guys communicating with women that, you know, hey, this isn't a male-only sport? Yes. Um, social media is huge, mm -hmm. of course. Um, there is a series called the W Series that is just a female mm. series, and it actually, they provide financial support to get women that have driving talent in the cars. So it's not just about having the financial resources. There are other women um, commissions, um, both in North America as well as internationally, that really work to inspire and empower women and show them that there are these opportunities. I want to know about hood ornaments. Mm -hmm. It's probably like trying to choose a child. You can't choose your favorite. But I'm going to ask you to get close. What would be your favorite hood ornament that you've ever taken a picture of? My, I'll give you two. Okay. My favorite hood ornament, and interestingly enough, are I always say my, and people think I've bought them. I didn't know it's the royal we. You know? <laughs> but the, the museum has just bought a 1937 cord, C-O-R-D. Mm -hmm. Many people who know cars still have never heard of a cord, mm -hmm. yeah. which may have been the most luxurious, most beautifully designed American car built before the war, before oh. World War II. But like many luxury cars, they could not survive the Depression. Mm -hmm. because they were costing $5,000 when in the Depression people were making 1000 a year. Yeah. So, yeah, couldn't afford it. But the cord hood ornament, which I love Art Deco, and it's a C with double lines through here that just screams Art oh, Deco. Oh, oh, and I love that. Oh, and oh. I, I would invite everyone to come see our new cord, which is gorgeous. The second one, which is a little more exciting, a lot of silent film stars had great big cars in the 20s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Rudolph Valentino was one. And he bought three Voisson French cars when he was in Paris and brought two of them back. And I wonder often how he did it. Was it by boat? Did they go to South America? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But he brought it back and then a friend of his uh, who was another silent yeah. film star, made, had one made for the front of this Voisson. Mm -hmm. And it mm. is about this tall, and it's a spitting cobra with ruby eye. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> there were standard hood ornaments, and there were Lalique Glass, for example, mm. made several custom hood ornaments. I've got one with an Egyptian woman you know, in that pure, beautiful glass. I mean, mm. they are gorgeous. They're I want you to beautiful. do a book idea. Please, <laughs> please, please, please. That would be a beautiful yeah. coffee table oh. book. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You mentioned, uh, Deanna, different types of races. Mm -hmm. And so if we're not going to go fast, 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 tell us about a race. I, I read something about, you know, it's not about how fast you go. It's about you know calculating the time to get there, doing checkpoints. Mm, yes. What kind of a race is that, and why why do we do that? Why do you do that? So that is a road rally, a road which rally. Oh, uh, SCCA um, does hold road rally events, and it's really about driving with a purpose. And it is a team sport, so you have a driver and a navigator, mm -hmm. and you have a set of instructions, and it gives you um, tells you where to turn, but not explicitly so they'll use landmarks or um, mystery style clues uh, oh. different things like that to um, that's fun yes <laughs> you have to use your brain yes and so the goal is to follow those instructions make the right turns and show up at a um, specific point at a specific time 
So, so cool. That sounds yeah. like something they did in like the 50s or the 40s, yes. but they still do it today? They still do it today, yes. And yeah. what and what kind of cars are used? It's just street cars. Just street I mean, cars? I think maybe there might be some um, historic vintage rallies, but um, most of the ones that we're involved in are just your street cars. So it's really easy to get for anybody to get involved and do those, those kinds of events. How cool. Yeah. You guys are so fascinating. And we <laughs> want to get that in. It's the Midwest Dream Car Collection. Right. Mid West Dream Car Collection in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. okay. That's the name of the museum because I figured you're one to do that. And thank you, Deanna and Ann. Yes. Man, I want to get in the car. And, I <laughs> yeah. <bet you> <laughs> yeah. and by the way, uh, KTWU has Women on Wheels coming up June 11th. So I hope that you bring your car or just come out and look at them. <laughs> so after a short break, Danielle and Leslie and I will be back to talk about a little bit more of this and do some little cruise control. Hang on, we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Janet Thompson-Jackson, and I'm so excited to be a part of Inspire today. Are you one of those people who feels like, I just don't have time to work out? I want to, I would, if I could, but I just don't have the time. Well, today, I am going to show you some yoga moves and just some general movement that you can do while you're sitting in your chair. You can do this in a small space if you don't have access to a yoga studio, or if you just don't feel comfortable going to a studio. Let's sit down and get started. Simply, you can start with one leg, lifting, lifting, and using your core lifting. Using that core to lift your leg. See how much you can lift. And then if you really get to the point where you can sit on the edge, and then you have to go back a little bit and then we're lifting and we're lifting and we're lifting and again we're using that core all right so those are some exercises that you can do if you're in just a very small space if you're in your office if you're in your living room or dining room at any time you can incorporate these throughout the day. Oh, there's one that I wanted to show you that I almost forgot, and that is seated pigeon. So let's just do that really quickly. It's just crossing your legs, and the reason I wanna do this one is that you can be in a meeting and no one knows you're doing this. Cross your legs with your ankle over your knee, and this may be enough of a stretch for many people. This is all you have to do, and you're feeling that. What You're gonna feel it in the hip of the leg that you're crossing. So this may be enough. If you need a little bit more, you can gently push your knee down, very gently. And if you need a little bit more of a stretch, then again, at the waist, after engaging your core, start to come forward a little bit. Oh, and I'm really feeling that in my hip. My hip is saying, thank you, you're giving me a little bit of love, I needed that. And then do the same thing, of course, on the other side. Again, this may be your stretch right here, or you may wanna just gently push down on that knee, or again, with your chest lifted, think about your chest coming down to your leg, not your stomach. Chest coming down, I'm keeping it lifted, and I'm still pushing a little bit and feeling that stretch. And that is something really, sitting down tightens our hips so much. This is something that we really should be doing every day. All right, I hope some of that is helpful for you and get moving. Whatever you do, just get moving. I'm Janet Thompson Jackson and I hope I've inspired you to get up and move. back and ladies we had a great conversation earlier about women on wheels and we've been truly inspired by automobiles since their creation so what are your chances of actually getting on the track or actually taking up a hobby that has something to do with automotives i want to do the road rally because that sounds fun i mean you know just making sure you're there on time and the following the clues is kind of like a mystery yes i do too so um i have to be honest I want to go to driving school. 
Do you That's really? I do. I do. I mean, you already I got do. a little start on it, so I mean, you might as well go ahead and get professional <laughs> training. <laughs> I mean, you know, I would like to be able to drive fast with skill. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm interested in doing. The thought of the day was drive slow. You know, go slow to drive fast. Right. I remember hearing that. Right. Yeah. Yes. Right. And, and that's learning brilliant. all the fundamentals. Right. Yes. And that's even fun. though you admitted to speeding, you have not said <laughs> you have well, we not said the, the maker that. model of the car. So we don't know that. <laughs> Okay, so here's another thing that that Jay, the producer of this, was uh, did a lot of research, and he was talking about all the women throughout history who have mm. done so much, like like inventing the windshield wiper, yes. and also Emily Post that uh, some of us grew up with because yeah. she was Miss Manners basically. Right. Yes, she wrote in a little book how a woman could drive herself. She didn't have to have a man with her. She could actually drive the man and she never had to be chaperoned. So really? I think women were going strong in the 40s. Absolutely. So, mm -hmm. Did she talk about necking in the back seat? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, probably didn't have that. No, 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 no. I didn't want to But that. you know, hey, Emily Post talked about everything else. I mean, might as well bring that up. But I'm fascinated now because I think it was Anne that was talking about all the hood ornaments. Oh, oh yeah. And you know, one of my favorites is a Maybach. So uh -huh. I would love to actually have my own, not just a picture, oh, but you know, uh -huh. that's like my goal. But I mean, they actually, you know, a lot of people are stealing yeah, the they, ornaments. Right. And so right. they actually fold into the hood, the Maybach's do. Oh so my God. Go they're, girl. They're, I'm serious, very So intelligent. don't forget to right. fold it back exactly. in. Exactly, right. fold it back right. in. So we'll have to get a picture right. of the Maybach. Right, but yes. this, I think your idea to get Anne to do a book is a great she idea. Should. A I coffee mean, table book wow. with a lot of the pictures. She has so much Does. history. Yes. Yes. yes, so much history. She is fascinating. A walking very. encyclopedia. And I'm thinking yes. how wonderful for a woman to have all this knowledge. She does presentations and you can go visit at all the museums. I yes. think it's wonderful. I yes. think it's wonderful too. We need to do that. So yeah, do I it. think we should. Do it. A road, road trip. trip. I'm just saying. <laughs> and Leslie's driving. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get there. Make time. <laughs> uh, I'm all over it. Well, listen. That's all the time we have for today. We sure hope you've been inspired by today's conversation about women on wheels. Don't forget, you can watch this program again at watch.kcwu.org. And if you are so inspired to learn more about our guests and the women making moves in our community, be sure to visit our website, www.kcwu.org forward slash inspire. Inspiring women, inspiring you on KTWU. Thank you for watching. Inspire is sponsored by Kansas Furniture Mart, using furniture to inspire conversation. And by the Blanche Bryden Foundation.